All right, welcome everybody to our April webinar. We are talking about taxes with the lovely Liz Mason. And so um, we are welcoming everybody to uh, ask questions and we'll make sure that you've got all of the contact information to get the answers that you need. Um, but to introduce our lovely presenter today, Liz is a CPA by day and adventurer by night. Throughout her career, she has worked for national firms, a local firm, and now focuses on running High Rock Accounting as a co-founder and CEO. High Rock is a technology company that happens to do accounting. They focus on implementing next level technology solutions, streamlining processes and tools, and ultimately are an accounting and finance business partner for clients functioning as an outsourced accounting and finance department. They provide services from CFO level all the way down to basic accounting. And today we are so excited to um, be able to have her on the line talking about tax reform and what that means for your business. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it right over to you. Thank you, Kendall. I appreciate the awesome introduction. And hi to all of you. Today we'll focus on tax reform and specifically what it means for your business. Now there were a ton of changes and so, you know, a little joke here, may the odds ever be in your favor. Um, you know, hopefully it's influencing you for the better and helping your business and not hurting. So Kendall gave a great introduction for me, but I'm Liz, I'm really nerdy. I love to help small businesses grow. That's what I focus my time on and I do plot world domination on a daily basis. So highlights of the Tax Cuts and Job Act as it affects small businesses. There were big rate changes. Uh, there's new small business deduction available, which I'm sure you guys have all heard about. It's a 20% deduction. We'll go into a lot of detail on what that means and how it can help your business and who qualifies as well. There were significant depreciation changes. So if you're planning to buy new equipment, you should be aware of what's going on with depreciation. Meals and entertainment, there were significant changes here. Unfortunately, these are not generally in anyone's favor. And there were other changes that affect your business. So let's start with a little bit of a refresher. So small to medium sized businesses can be anywhere from a sole proprietorship all the way up to a C corporation. And each one of those entity types are taxed differently and have been since they were created. So a sole proprietorship, if that's your type of business, you report that on your Form 1040 Schedule C and you're taxed at the individual income tax rates. So everything that changed in terms of your individual rates will affect you. For a partnership, you're reported on a Form 1065, which is a partnership tax return, and the income flows through to the partners. That means that it's still taxed at the individual rate. A corporation is the only entity type that's going to be taxed at the corporate level. And that's reported on a Form 1120, and it's taxed at corporate tax rates, which are different from the individual rates. Now, an S corporation is an election that either a corporation or a partnership or an LLC can make to be. So if you're taxed as an S corporation, you're reported on Form 1120S and your income still flows through to the individual owners and it's taxed at the individual rates. Now there are single member LLCs and multi-member LLCs. Single member LLCs default to being taxed as a sole proprietorship. However, you can make an election to be taxed as either a partnership or an S corporation, or if you make a very specific tax election, you can be taxed as a corporation. A multi-member LLC without any elections defaults to being taxed as a partnership, but again, can make elections to be taxed as any um, a partnership, a corporation, or an S corporation. So there you have it. There are a lot of different entity types, and I wanted to refresh on what we'll be focusing on today so that you understand the pieces of the tax law and how it affects how your specific business is taxed. Now, the first big change was a change to the tax rate. So these are the new tax brackets. This is for single individual income tax um, filers, if you file single, and this is for 2018. And you can see there's a big gap if you make over $157,500, you jump up from a 24% tax bracket to a 32% tax bracket, which is a pretty big increase. 
Um, these rates replace what was previously enacted. So for 2017, the tax rates went up to 39.6% and there were more uh, levels as well. Now for a married filing joint return, these would be the tax brackets. So you can see that the rates are basically the same. However, you have uh, bigger brackets for taxable income before you reach the next level. Now, the reason I'm starting with individual rates is most Arizona small businesses are, in fact, flow-through entities. Now, a flow-through or a pass-through entity is what we were talking about earlier, a partnership, a sole proprietorship, an S-corporation. These are the ones that are taxed at the individual tax rate. Now, the corporate tax rate also changed. So everybody at big corporations is having a party. Um, this looks like a really lame party, but, but you know, fun, more fun than normal corporate world. Uh, there's a flat rate now of 21%. Previously, the tax rates went all the way up to, well, technically 39%, but the average was taxed at about 34%. So it's a pretty big decrease in tax rate from a corporate level. So if you are a C corporation, you can, you're going to see a decrease in tax going forward. Okay, so this is the big question that I get most often right now. What is this qualified business income deduction and what does it mean? So a lot of people were referring to it as the small business kickback or the small business deduction and asking a million questions regarding what it is. So let's dive into what this means. This particular deduction is 20% and it's the flow through, pass through deduction. Um, however they want to call it, the actual code section is 199A and it gives you 20% uh, deduction. So you take your income and you deduct an extra 20% before you get to your taxable income. Now why is this great? It's great because you saw on the previous slide we have a flat rate tax of, for corporations of 21%. So that decreased corporate tax. Now the individual rates didn't decrease that much. So Congress said, well how do we give small businesses some kind of incentive that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten? And this is what they came up with. So for the majority of Arizona businesses, if you're making, uh, if you're in a single tax bracket and you're making less than $157,000, you are eligible for this 20%. If you're in the married filing joint bracket and you're making less than $315,000, you're eligible for this deduction. Now the deductions do phase out. For single taxpayers that make over $207,500, you don't get a deduction. And for married taxpayers making over $415,000, you don't get a deduction. So you have to make sure that your income is less than that. Now, there are some other exclusions. Um, of course, surprise, surprise, the IRS has exclusions on things. First, service businesses are excluded. Now, this is a huge area of contention. This is a brand new law. There is no case law supporting what a service business means. So, some people are being very aggressive with what this means and others are not. In this case, service business broadly defined includes lawyers, accountants, medical professionals, and they did recently amend to include architecture and engineering firms. It's basically any business that primarily gets revenue from services performed for their clients. If that's a portion of what you're doing and you're also selling a product, um, you may not qualify as a service company. I would talk to your CPA particularly about what you do and why you either believe you are or are not a service company. Now, this deduction does not apply to service companies. I want to make that very clear that if you are a lawyer, let's say, or an accountant like myself, we will not be able to take this deduction at all, um, which is too bad in my opinion. Now, it's limited to, and this is where the calculation gets fun, it's limited to 50% of the W-2 wages paid by your business. So if you're a sole proprietorship and you don't pay any W-2 wages, right there you're limited. Um, and then the other piece of the limitation is if you invested in qualified property. So let's say you bought your manufacturing company and you bought a big piece of equipment. So let's say your equipment 
um, expenditure was $100,000, but you had no W-2 wages, you would be limited to 2.5% of that equipment expenditure. So $2,500 would be your deduction for this, regardless of what your income was. So you can see that there are some limits. Um, the 50% W-2 wages would be if you're a business and you do pay W-2 wages, you're limited to 50% of that for the deduction, even if 20% of your net income is higher. I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit complicated to calculate, but I want to make sure that I impose on you how complicated it is, and it's not just a straight 20% uh, deduction. Additionally, this excludes compensation to the owners of a partnership or an S corporation. So unfortunately, um, when you're calculating this, you can't include your, your income from that partnership or S corporation. So if you're an S corp and you were paid W-2 wages, um, as you should be, uh, that those wages cannot be used to gross up your revenue for the deduction. Additionally, it's only on US sourced income. So if you're making income overseas, unfortunately, that income is not qualified right off the bat. So this qualified business income deduction is a very big deal. It should apply to most local businesses. However, service businesses are excluded and there are limits on how much you can take and then also when you can take it and when it's phased out. So be aware of that and understand when you talk to your CPA at year end for your business that it's not a very easy answer and that it does require some forethought and conversations as well. Now there were also big changes on depreciation. Now I'm a big fan of depreciation. Depreciation makes sure that you know people can get credit for the investments that they're making in their business. And the big point of being allowed to take depreciation is you know to make sure you're you're getting a deduction for increasing the equipment that you're using um, and being able to reinvest into the company. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard of Section 179 depreciation. Over the last 10 years, this has been a fun section. It goes up, it goes down. Some years, you know, you're waiting until January to find out if it's even a thing. You don't know if you can invest or not. Well, the good news is this tax uh, uh, act increased the Section 179 um, enacted. So it is enacted for the foreseeable future. The base amount allowed was also increased to $1 million, um, and then it's adjusted for inflation each year. And the phase-out level increased to $2.5 million. So if you invest more than $2.5 million, you're not going to see the 179 deduction. However, um, your base amount um, of $1 million, you can still deduct. So if you're a local business, I doubt you're going to be investing more than $1 million in equipment this year um, and if you are more power to you that's awesome you're growing and that's fantastic uh, but up to that you can deduct it so that's a hundred percent deduction in year one now section 179 is still subject to um, all the provisions it was before so it's reported separately and you have to um, pay ordinary income on gains associated with equipment that you take that 179 deduction on now, they also increased what's eligible. Previously, building improvements were subject to a lot of scrutiny when it came to this deduction. They expanded what qualifies for this deduction. So again, I recommend you talk to your CPA and discuss what you're buying and why and which way to depreciate it best. Now, another really cool thing that this act did was it increased bonus depreciation. Now, bonus depreciation is another way to deduct um, your, your depreciation in year one. So previously, bonus depreciation was limited to 50% of the cost of the equipment. Now it's 100%. So you have choices. You can say, OK, I'm going to deduct it under Section 179, or I'm going to take bonus depreciation and take 100% in year one, which is fantastic, right? You have these options. Um, it now includes used property, which is a big expansion of bonus depreciation. Prior to 2018, it had to be brand new property that you purchased. You could not purchase used equipment. And as we know, in this type of economy, people are trying to be thrifty and, and keep their expenses low. And a lot of times that means buying used furniture 
or buying used manufacturing equipment or making sure that you're refurbishing as much as possible. Well, now bonus depreciation can be taken on that used equipment, which is a big win for small business. Another thing to keep in mind when you're looking at depreciation and capitalization policies in general, you're still allowed to uh, have a capitalization policy on your books, so not for tax purposes, but for just accounting purposes, um, and use that capitalization policy as long as it's under $2,500 as your deduction for, for tax purposes. So. What I mean by that is you can say, for books, I expense all equipment that's less than $2,500. So you take the expense right now um, for your book purposes. If you do that for your books, you can also do it for tax. That is not bonus. That is not 179. That is just an expense of the business. And that is an acceptable method of accounting according to the IRS. So that, that still exists. And a lot of businesses don't take advantage of that, but they should. So other changes to depreciation, um, the, there was a, a section for um, leasehold improvements or, or property improvements, um, building improvements. That was expanded for the 15-year deduction. Otherwise, they would be 39-year um, or 37.5, depending on the lease. And then it caps the passenger car. Um, the caps on the passenger car depreciation were increased. So previously, there were very low caps on what you could depreciate for um, a passenger automobile, and the caps were, you know, a couple thousand dollars for most cars. Now they're increased um, to be a little higher, so that's great. Computers are no longer listed property. What does that mean? Listed property requires more disclosure with the IRS and more information reporting and collection. Computers have been taken off of that list. They're no longer listed property, which means that you don't have to document quite as much to get the deduction for the use of a computer in a business. There were also significant changes to farming property. Now, I bring that up because we do have some local farms in Arizona. And if you are a farm and listening, you should review the entire piece of the law as it relates to farm equipment uh, because it increases the deductions that are allowed and it changes the lives and um, methods allowed to use for farming equipment, which is a big deal because farms, um, you know, do make up a big percentage of, of the economy, right? So depreciation is fun. <laughs> and there were a lot of changes that should help businesses. All right, so other modifications to this that are affecting small businesses. Net operating losses. So let's take a step back. What is a net operating loss? A net operating loss is a loss that you create in a prior year and you carry forward. So let's say you're one of my business, I invest $100,000 and I make zero money. So I've spent $100,000. I have a net operating loss carryover of $100,000. Now year two, let's say I make $200,000 and let's say year two is 2017. In 2017, um, I deduct 100,000 of that, no problem. So I have $100,000 that's taxed at the end of 2017. Let's say I made a $100,000 loss in year one, and year two, I only made $100,000 of income. In 2017, I would offset it dollar for dollar. So I would take my entire NOL, net operating loss, against my entire taxable income. So I would have a zero taxable income for 2017. For 2018, that's no longer possible. Now, let's say I have a $100,000 NOL carryover, it's 2018, and I have $100,000 of income. You would think you can set it dollar for dollar, but you can't. Now it's limited to 80% of income. So I'm only allowed to take 80% of that deduction, which means $80,000. So I still have 20,000 of taxable income. And that 20,000 of NOL that's left over carries forward to next year and the same limits apply. So you can only take NOLs up to 80% of net taxable income. And that's a pretty big deal, especially for big corporations right now um, because there are NOL carryovers that they're hoping to use that they're not going to be able to completely use. 
Uh, we also have to be aware for it, aware of it in the small business arena because if you had NOL leading up to this year and you were excited to use them to offset all of your income, that's not happening, and you still have taxable income, at least 20% that you're going to have to pay estimated taxes on. So please be cognizant of that. Another big loss is the domestic productions activity deduction. Now, DPAD was created as a way to encourage business in the U.S. So it was a deduction that people were allowed to take for producing things within the United States. A lot of small businesses, a lot of people in Arizona took advantage of this deduction because it was up to about 9% um, and was a big deal for producing things locally. That's gone. 2018, no longer, not limited in any other way, it's just gone. So be aware of that. Um, previously, you were able to take a deduction for providing transportation for your employees. Now, this isn't a huge deal in Arizona because we don't have very much public transit uh, to provide as a benefit to our employees. However, you still can't provide anything if you're buying light rail passes for them, unfortunately, that's no longer a fringe benefit that you can take a deduction for. A good add, though, is there's now a credit available for paid family and medical leave. So if, you're, if you have an employee that goes on to FMLA, so they leave for a legitimate family medical reason, um, you, there is a credit available for their wages that you pay them during the period that they're gone. So I like to bring that up so that people can um, look at that, especially if you have, you know, somebody going on maternity leave or taking care of a sick parent, um, legitimate reasons. It's nice to be able to have a credit from the federal government to subsidize those wages. There are limitations. So if you're thinking about taking that credit, I would talk to both your CPA and an HR person to make sure that you're in compliance with all of the limitations. This is a big one, business, meals, and entertainment. Prior to this new tax law, entertainment expense, business meals, anything that you could prove was related to your business was 50% deductible. Now, it's very different. So, entertainment expenses at all are not deductible, at all. 0% deductible. They're completely disallowed. So if you're buying season tickets um, and giving them out to your, your staff or your clients as a thank you, that's not happening anymore as a business deduction. Obviously, you can still do it for fun, but it won't be allowed as a deduction. Um, business meals are still limited to 50%. However, there used to be an exception for meals provided on site. Uh, for example, if you're working late and your employer brought in dinner so that everybody could eat, that used to be 100% deductible. Now it's 50% deductible, which makes a big difference for um, employers that frequently do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's also that limitation is imposed to 50% for meals taken to client sites um, that you are providing as a benefit to them. Unfortunately, they're taking a much harder stance on business meals and entertainment. Again, entertainment is no longer deductible at all. Uh, so if you do have high entertainment expense, you might want to look at that and consider that it's now going to be effectively your tax rate higher. So for most people in Arizona, probably 25% increase in cost. The only exception to these rules are the holiday party rules you are still allowed to deduct a holiday party at 100% as long as it's, you know, within reason. So there are very specific rules as to what within reason means, uh, but effectively it's not super lavish. You're paying for it on behalf of all of your employees, not your highest compensated employees, um, and it is part of your benefit package effectively. This is an area that we're getting a ton of questions on. Anytime that there are limitations, people like to know what's going on. Now, another thing uh, that I didn't specifically put a bullet point on, but I'd like to discuss is club dues. So club dues have never been deductible. 
Now, there were some very interesting exceptions. If you could make an argument that being a member of that club furthered your business and you could prove that it furthered your business, people were deducting it. Now, they have very specific language written into the tax code at this point, excluding those exclusions. So club dues are not deductible at all, and there's no way around it at this point. They have very much plugged those holes. Okay, so I did a little summary here so we could talk through the entity types, the new tax rates, and, and what the different things that I've been discussing today look like for you. So first off, a sole proprietorship, again, is taxed at individual tax rates. So those tax changes that I spoke about earlier on the rates and the brackets will affect you. Sole proprietorships do qualify for the QBI deduction. That's the Qualified Business Income Deduction subject to the exclusions and the limitations that I spoke about earlier. Extra depreciation is allowed for sole proprietorships. The other changes do apply to sole proprietorships and meals and entertainment are now limited for sole proprietorships. Partnerships, subject to the change in the individual tax brackets, and that makes a big change to how that income or how much of that income is taxed. They are eligible for the QBI deduction. Extra depreciation is allowed. Other changes are applicable to partnerships, and meals and entertainment are applicable. For S corporations, again, the individual tax bracket changes make a big difference on, on the tax rate that people are paying for S corporation income. They are allowed for QBI deduction, extra depreciation is allowed, the other changes apply, and meals and entertainment also apply. For C corporations, the flat corporate tax rate now applies. So there are no graduated rates for C-Corps anymore. It no longer starts low and goes high. It is everybody is paying the 21%. C-Corps are not eligible for the qualified business income deduction at all. The extra depreciation changes do are allowed for C-Corps. The other changes do apply and meals and entertainment are um, again limited for C-Corporation. So I wanted to say thank you for everyone for coming and discussing what the new tax law looks like for business entities. If you have any questions at all, I've included a lot of contact information here for me and my company. We do a little YouTube show um, called The Hot Accounts where we discuss small and, and mid-sized business topics and we are always looking for guests that are willing to eat hot sauce and discuss fun things with us. Uh, so I highly recommend checking out our YouTube channel if you're interested in learning more about uh, SMBs, small and medium-sized businesses. Again, thank you so much for having me today and I appreciate you guys listening.